Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. We're um, just waiting for a few more people to join us, but we'll be um, starting very shortly. So please bear with us. Stian, can we hear you? I hope so. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I was just checking everything works okay. Yeah, that's good. Where are you at the moment, Stian? Uh, I'm here in uh, Chamonix, so uh, it's actually been uh, the coldest I can remember in years. It's It was minus 16 here today, so it's uh, proper winter, and wow. uh, we're just waiting for a big storm to roll in in the next couple of days and expecting about a meter of snow. So, I was just going to say, the UK has been, uh, been pretty cold, but... Not, that, not quite that cold. <laughs> no, I know it's been uh, unusual, but uh, it's good to feel proper winter. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, we'll we'll we'll, um, we'll make a start. But thank you, everyone, for for joining us this, this evening. Um, tonight's event is is uh, being supported by Arcterex, and um, Stan is a an Arcterex ambassador. So big thank you for Arcterex. For um, and Stan for giving us um, his his time tonight. Um, Stan is a, a professional professional skier, and a um, for the last ten years he's been a mountain guide. And through his work, he's had to deal with decision making in avalanche terrain on a daily basis. Uh, so tonight he's joining us, sharing engaging stories and some of his insights about how he has used his skill and judgment. Uh, to stay alive, both as a pro skier and professional mountain guide. So a, a few things just before I hand over to Stian is um, we will be taking questions. So we'll be putting those to him at the end. So if you want to ask any questions, please use the Q&A function if you're on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, because we're also live on Facebook, please add any comments uh, and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. So I'll be looking after those as best as possible. So hopefully everything will go smoothly. So I will, uh, I'll now hand over to um, Stian. Over to you. Thank you, Mark. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, as uh, Mark said, my name is Stian Hagen. I am um, originally Norwegian, but I've lived here in Chamonix for about 20 years. And um, I've been a professional skier for about 20 years. And um, through my work, I've had to deal with uh, quite a bit of uh, avalanche decision making. And um, yeah, I think uh, maybe we'll start. Um, when I first arrived here in Chamonix, I was uh, about 18 years old and um, completely clueless when it came to uh, anything to do with avalanches. And uh, at the time, there was um, very little information out there and uh, people were uh, yeah, just kind of going for it. And uh, the first basically 10 years as a um, ski bomb and professional skier here in Chamonix, I was uh, very lucky. I didn't uh, actually have to deal with any uh, major avalanche issues. But as time went on, um, the um, net started tightening. And um, at one point, uh, I heard about some friends that had been in some accidents. And it was just kind of getting closer and closer to, um, to uh, it felt like it was going to be my turn. And um, the first time I uh, experienced um, a pretty bad uh, avalanche was on a trip to, um, to uh, British Columbia. It was kind of like a dream trip, really. When you look uh, on the paper, we were, I was with my wife, that's also a professional skier. And um, we were sailing up the coast of uh, British Columbia on a 120 foot yacht with a helicopter on deck and uh, <clears throat> we were making a ski movie up there. So we were basically sailing up the coast and uh, stopping the boat wherever we thought we can find some 
good ski terrain uh, and then flew up in the helicopter and um, filmed it. At least that's what it sounded like on paper. The reality was that, um, uh, as you probably know, BC is very not very known for their great weather. And that's obviously one of the reasons why they have really good snow. So most of the time we were stuck on the boat and um, that felt more like a floating prison than a luxury yacht after a while. But anyway, um, we ended up getting some some sunny days. And if I can uh, work this here now, I'll uh, show you guys a little movie from that trip and uh, what happened. Let's see here. Appears to be something wrong with my mouse. Uh, huh. I don't know what's going on here. Are you guys seeing this? No? So we can just see the slide of you skiing. Uh, uh, here, I think. Did that work? That should work, I think. Are you seeing that, Mark? We can see that. Okay. So uh, basically flew into the terrain. So this is, uh, this is me skiing first. You can see my wife and uh, another skier on the top here. And uh, let's see what happened. When the skiing is this epic, it's easy to forget that there's danger lurking just below the surface. And with the closest hospital hours away, this is no place to push your luck. the biggest slide I've ever been in, for sure. It's probably the scariest crash I've ever had to. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty humble right now. You gotta respect the mountains. Yeah. So, um, that was uh, my wife going down in the slide and that, was kind of the first time in my career where I was really got first-hand experience uh, with a big avalanche. Uh, luckily, um, she uh, only um, broke her knee, basically her ACL, and I think MCL, and uh, and nothing else. <clears throat> but uh, it was an eye-opening experience for both of us, for sure. And um, the year after, I actually went back to the to the same place um, and ended up in another avalanche. And um, that summer, I realized that I had to do something, educate myself, and uh, learn more about avalanches. Um, so I started my mountain guides education and uh, basically read as much as I could about avalanche safety. And um, the first thing that happened uh, the next winter, basically in January uh, after this, uh, was that my best friend died in the avalanche here in Chamonix. Uh, and at that point, um, I lost all confidence in my decision making in avalanche terrain, I found it uh, extremely, I, I mean, I had the best job in the in the world, in my, my opinion, but at the same time, I was scared every time I went out and um, what seemed like the best or should have been the best job in the world all of a sudden became the worst job in the world because I was scared of dying the whole time. And um, so I decided that I, I if I was going to keep doing this job, I needed to do uh, something and figure out a way of dealing with avalanches 
Um, and what I did was that first of all, I, I had to uh, figure out what my risk acceptance for uh, avalanches was because you can ski and um, uh, avoid avalanches if you want to. I mean, if you stay in terrain that's less than 30 degrees steep, uh, there's no chance there can be an avalanche. But uh, that was not the type of skiing I was interested in. Um, and what I figured out was that uh, I accepted that basically at some point, probably with the amount of exposure time I have that someday I will probably get caught in an avalanche, but I can accept that as long as I didn't get killed in an avalanche. So basically um, what I was looking into was finding a way of avoiding getting uh, killed in avalanches. And um, I started out by looking at all accidents reports that I could find, uh, both from Scandinavia, the Alps, and Canada, and really look through all the avalanches where the very fatalities to see if there was some connection between all these um, avalanches with fatalities, uh, and it was something to be learned there. And what I found was quite interesting because when you look into this and start reading all these accident reports, what you see is that 99% of avalanches where someone dies there is one common thing. And that one thing is that there is an avalanche trap involved in the accident. And what that tells you is that if you can avoid avalanche traps, you have a very, very good chance of surviving. Um, so uh, what are avalanche traps? And uh, Basically, avalanche traps, I'd say there's four main categories of avalanche traps. Um, the first one is if there's a cliff um, or something underneath where you're skiing and you get avalanched and you actually fall off and you, you die from the impact of the fall itself. That's the first one. Second one is if there is a stationary object in the path of the avalanche itself. So basically, if you get avalanched, you get um, the impact into something stationary. If that is, there could be a building, it could be trees, it could be a rock, a cliff face, anything, and you die from from uh, the trauma of the of the impact. Uh, the third one is uh, convexities in the terrain. So basically, somewhere where you're going to fall in and a lot of snow is going to come on top of you. So the avalanche can't spread out over a big area, but the snow gets forced into, to, uh, it could be like a ditch, a river valley, anything like that. And basically what happens is that you get buried so deep that it's going to take way too long to dig you out uh, in time for you to survive. And uh, <laughs> the last one is uh, cornices. So basically, any time on the ridge line or a peak where you have a predominant wind direction, where it, where it builds a big cornice on one side, and um, if you step on the wrong place, this cornice falls down and starts an avalanche, and you fall down with it. Uh, <clears throat> so if you can avoid avalanche traps, you're looking very good. There's a very little chance of you dying in avalanche. And uh, so that's somewhere I would spend, I have spent myself and I would recommend you guys to spend a lot of time is to learn to recognize avalanche traps when you're out skiing. And that's, you could be, even if you're skiing on the resort, look around you, be aware of how the terrain looks and imagine an avalanche coming down and what would happen with that snow. Um, and then, uh, when you look at the 1% of the accidents uh, with fatalities where there were no um, avalanche traps, basically all of those involved either uh, solo skier. So if you go out there by yourself and you get caught in the avalanche, there's no one there to, uh, to rescue you. You're probably gonna die. Or skiers uh, with little or no experience um, in uh, performing a rescue and or with bad equipment. So the next kind of, 
I'd say lay, layer of safety um, that I like to talk about after the avoiding the avalanche traps is the group. And when it comes to the group, there's a couple of things. And um, one thing is the size of the group you ski with. Um, obviously, the biggest uh, part of an avalanche rescue is the excavation of, of the buried person. And there's always good to have a lot of manpower to dig someone out. It's got to be quicker uh, if you have more people shoveling. At the same time, if the group is too big, I think it's more likely that you could end up uh, in a situation where you have an avalanche in the first place because the group is harder to control when it's bigger. So having the right group size, I think, is really important. And the way I like to look at it is, um, I guess most people know about the avalanche scale that goes from one to five. I'd like to say that the minimum amount of people in the group should equal the number of the avalanche uh, scale on the day. So if it's avalanche scale one um, or avalanche danger one, you could probably go out and ski by yourself and be all right. If it's avalanche danger two, you should probably be minimum two people in the group. Avalanche danger three, minimum three people in the group. And if it's avalanche danger four, you should probably stay at home because uh, you shouldn't be skiing on avalanche danger four. And the maximum number of people in the group, in my opinion, uh, is five. And unless it's a group with a clear leader, like a guide uh, that makes all the decisions. And that's because I think it's very difficult to control a bigger group than five people. Imagine if you have like a fantastic powder day and everybody is frothing and, um, and uh, you're standing on top of a slope, it's very easy that people start skiing and um, without clear communication in the group. The other thing with the group that I find is very important is um, the way you travel as a group through the train and especially uh, on the way down. Um, for this system to work, you should never expose more than one uh, member of the group uh, to avalanche terrain at any given time. Um, if, you, if you're two people in the group and both of you get caught in the avalanche, it's no one there to, to help you. So always ski one at a time. And when you ski one at a time, that means skiing one at a time from a safe zone to another safe zone. So basically, uh, safe zones would be um, somewhere you're standing up high where you can't get caught up by an avalanche. It could be behind a big rock, behind a tree, anything like that. And uh, one um, product uh, or piece of equipment um, that could make this even better and that I hope is going to be part of the uh, standard avalanche equipment for the future is um, a two-way radio. And uh, I have one here just to show you guys. It's a BCA. It's a pretty simple two-way radio with a, with a microphone that you can have on your backpack. And the reason why I think that is uh, really important is because uh, it can help you have a clear uh, line of communication between the members of the party. And <clears throat> when it comes to skiing from safe zone to safe zone, if you have a clear line of communication uh, through a two-way radio, you're able to uh, increase the distance you can ski and still uh, communicate. And sometimes there's no safe zones for maybe two, 300 meters. But if you have that radio, you can still communicate with the person behind you. And it's great for safety, but it's also great for um, getting the best skiing. I don't know how many times I've skied down somewhere and looked back up and realized that the best line is 50 meters to the left or right. So I think, uh, I think and hope that um, two-way radio will be part of the standard avalanche equipment package um, <clears throat> in the future. 
And um, while we're at the, the equipment, um, there are like there has been a lot of <clears throat> new equipment coming out on the market in the last couple of years that have made a big difference, uh, especially on the beacons. If your uh, avalanche beacon looks anything like this, it's time to put that in uh, the recycling bin and uh, pick up a new beacon. The new three antenna beacons that we have today are so much better and quicker and more reliable. So uh, if you don't have a brand new beacon, it's time to invest in a new one. Uh, that's a very good investment. <laughs> the other thing um, is the, the shovel. Um, basically, you bring a shovel um, to dig your friend out of an avalanche. So out of respect, respect to your friends, bring a proper shovel. Uh, if it's made out of plastic, it has no place in the avalanche rescue kit. Have a proper uh, aluminum or metal shovel <coughs> of a proper size. I prefer a D-handle like this. I think that uh, makes digging easier. Extendable handle. This is a, should be a proper tool. And um, I actually sometimes, I, um, at the start of the day, if I have new clients or uh, skiing with new people, I get everyone to take their shovels out. And uh, <clears throat> whoever has the lightest shovel has to carry whoever has the heaviest shovel shovel. Uh, and that usually stops people from cheating with their weight trying to carry a light shovel. So bring a proper, proper shovel, a proper tool. It's out of respect for your for your uh, fellow skiers. Uh, the other thing um, I like to uh, talk a little bit about is um, actually trading for uh, uh, avalanche rescue situations. And um, I see a lot of people trading and spending a lot of time trading with their beacons and uh, I mean, that's a good thing, unless uh, you forget about the other parts of the avalanche training uh, or rescue training. And with these modern beacons, actually a search for one person is very easy. It, uh, Disney's be beacons are so intuitive. It's uh, The other day I actually gave it for fun to my six-year-old daughter and dug down the beacon in the garden talked to her for about a minute about how it works and she found the other beacon within two minutes. Uh, so as we talked about before, if there's only one person skiing at the time, we're never going to have to search for more than one beacon. So learn how to use your beacon, but don't spend all your practice time on the beacon search. Because when you look at the overall time a, a rescue, an avalanche rescue takes, the beacon search is a very small part of it. Uh, where you lose a lot of time is on the excavation phase. And so I would spend more time uh, practicing how to dig efficiently uh, on, and in the best way. I'm not gonna go into all the details of the actual digging here now, but that is where a lot of people don't train and, but that is where you can save 10 minutes uh, if you do it in the right way compared to the wrong way. And the other thing is also practicing uh, the organization of the group uh, when something goes wrong. Because one thing is you think this and that, but when there's actually an avalanche and one of your friends are buried, it is a situation there's for sure someone's going to panic and a lot of time can get lost in the confusion of what's happened. First thing that happens, obviously, everybody turns their beacons over to search. So we're not searching for one of the, the guys that are not buried. Um, you know, people need, someone needs to get, do the search. Probably the best thing is to have one guy take, char take charge of the group and 
tell the other members of the group what to do. I'll do the search. Bob and Paul will get their shovel and probes out and be ready to do the excavation. And so practice all these, these parts of the, of the whole uh, scenario or potential scenario. And um, that will save you a lot of time, uh, very valuable time. Um, and I think that's um, something that in, in a real life scenario is gonna be really important. And so like, I think if you follow these kind of simple rules with avoid terrain traps, uh, get the group size right, uh, ski one at a time, uh, have the right equipment and be efficient with using it, you have a really, really good chance of not dying in an avalanche. And the whole idea here is kind of to get a little bit away from spending too much time trying to predict if there's going to be an avalanche or not by looking at the snow, because even the most experienced people out there find that extremely difficult. And uh, when I, whenever I come up to the top of a slope and look down, there is no way I'm going to be able to predict if that's slope is going to slide or not. So my approach is eliminate uh, factors. So I look at the slope. I'm like, OK, is there a terrain trap? No, no terrain trap. OK, how big is my group? OK, I'm with two other people. We're going to ski one at a time. And the two other people are Bob and Paul. They're highly experienced. They have good equipment. The weather is good. So it'll be easy. There's visibility. If we need a rescue, it's flying weather for a helicopter. Okay, I can ski. So eliminate these things and it will give you an answer if it's a go or not. And um, I think that is a safer and simpler way than to try and predict uh, an avalanche from, from uh, looking at the snowpack. So I think that was uh, kind of what I had um, planned for you guys tonight. I hope it kind of makes sense. Um, but I, I find that a lot of the time avalanche um, courses go too much into the nitty gritty of the snowpack and not really into the decision making that's going to make the difference between life and death. So. Hopefully this uh, can help you guys make some good decisions when um, you get out to the Alps and uh, get some snow under your skis. Thanks, thanks, Diane. That's um, that's great. I've got a few questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Totally. Give me one second. Um, okay, <clears throat> we'll kick off with. Actually, this one that was emailed in a couple of days ago, which oh, yeah. actually there's a, quite a few of these questions. You'll be um, no surprise. It's, it's mostly about kit, but you, you yeah. covered off quite quite a bit of information about kit. The advice about the two-way radio was really, really good. I think really solid because most people just think of shovel, probe and transceiver. But Sean asks, what avalanche? Um, no, sorry. Sean asks, do you use an Avalung? No, I uh, I don't. I used to. Uh, I don't anymore. And I'm predicting that it's probably going to be a question about, uh, about balloon airbags as well. And um, I, I've spent hours talking about this, but my approach is basically, I, I, I think both products are good. The one thing though, is that none of them work in an avalanche trap. There is not an avalanche trap in the world where it's gonna help to have a balloon bag or an avalon. Um, but that said, if you avoid avalanche traps and you do have a balloon pack, the chances of you being close to the surface are bigger than if you don't have one. And obviously, if you're closer to the surface 
or on top of the surface is always better than being buried. And I think to a certain extent that um, the Avalon can work, but in my experience and from talking to people that have been buried in avalanches, uh, the chances are that you might be in a position where you're not gonna be able to get to the avalon itself to put it in your mouth. My hands might be stuck like this, who knows? Um, so I think in theory, it's good and it's not a bad thing to have one, but um, um, I think that the problem with both, all products like that too is like if you, you can't bring them into your decision making when you're standing on top of a line. Don't get ready to ski down and you're like, I don't really, I'm not sure about it, but I've got an Avalon and a balloon pack, then you shouldn't ski. It. But I think it's good products to have, but just be aware of the, the fact that it can change your decision making, I think. Okay, that's, that's interesting, actually. The next question, Cassia asks, you talked about um, the, the transceivers there just mm -hmm. earlier. So she says, which, which Beacon brand do you recommend? A skier who passed away a year ago today had a Beacon, but the impact of the avalanche switched the Beacon off. Are there known ones that don't have this design fault? Yeah, I... I have been using the what I'm using right now is the the Mammoth Verivox S, uh, which I find to be really good. I I have probably fifteen, maybe more beacons in my drawer downstairs, and uh, right now this is my favorite. I think uh, most of the beacons from the from the top brands, the newer ones, are good. I know there's been issues with the uh, one particular brand that had a switch that uh, broke off. Uh, I haven't used that one myself, and uh, but uh, I, I have been very happy with the Mammoth one. So, in my experience, that's a great beacon. Um, but definitely, right. if your beacon looks like this, it's time to uh, head into your shop and get a new one. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for the plug there. The uh, next question, Des, Des asks, just we were talking about radios, obviously. Uh, he says, do two-way radios have any effect on the ability of a transceiver to search like a mobile phone does? Uh, no, they shouldn't do. Uh, so so this, <laughs> this radio is a, it's a BCA. Uh, the, obviously, BCA also makes beacons, and it's an avalanche. Uh, equipment company and uh, they claim that there's no <clears throat> no interference with the beacon and uh, I'm not experienced any myself so I think that's uh, good and actually my own experience with the um, with beacons and cell phones too I, I usually actually put my beacon I have pants with the two pockets on the on the legs and I'll put the beacon in uh, one pocket and the phone in the other and uh, so that'd be approximately 30 centimeters apart, which should be enough. And they're both on the outside of each leg. So I guess you have the meat of your legs in between. And uh, I have never had uh, any experience with the interference between my phone and my beacon doing it that way. And I actually find it easier <clears throat> and better to have my beacon in my um, pan pocket than having it on the harness because I find like uh, on the harness, I have like pants with, or bibs on, and then I have the harness with the beacon, and then I have your backpack on top. It's just so many straps. And um, I also find it easier to get the beacon out, to do the beacon check before we go out by having it in the pocket. And uh, actually in all the <coughs> accidents reports I've read, I've not ever read another report where someone's uh, had their pants ripped off. Uh, so it's among guides, it's considered okay to have your beacon in your pad pocket, but not. And there has been avalanche accidents with people have been, their jackets have been stripped off. And it's also the case with maybe on the warm spring day, you take your jacket off and you have the beacon in the pocket and you stick that in your pack and you pack are prone to get ripped off in avalanches. So, so keep your uh, beacon either, either on the harness or in your pad pockets. 
Yeah, so thank you. Uh, got an, an anonymous question here. You've you've talked about avalanche traps, but um, this this person just says, could you outline a bit more about what constitutes an avalanche trap? I know you you sort of went over it, but maybe you could just um, quickly go over it. Well, basically, uh, we can go the other way. We can say what's not an avalanche trap. Basically, an avalanche that has a, a big run out on a flat or like slightly down sloping area where the snow gets spread over a big area. Basically, there's very little chance that you're going to be buried very deep. And uh, there's nothing you can hit. So you, you actually won't get killed by trauma by hitting anything or falling off anything. Um, and then, so the avalanche traps are, is any time that the, the terrain will either force the snow, uh, a lot of snow into a small area, like in a ditch, uh, where you would have a deep burial, or <clears throat> where there's elements in the terrain that could kill you, uh, basically trauma, which is where you can get dragged into trees, um, it could be uh, buildings, rocks, or off a big cliff or anything. So it, it, if you're standing on top of a slope and it, it just perfectly spreads out over a big flat area, that's a, that's a good sign. If you're standing on top of a slope and there's a big forest at the bottom of the slope, that's not a good sign. If you're skiing down and there's a big cliff underneath you, that's not a good sign either. Or if there is a, at the bottom of the slope you're about to ski, there's a big river running down there. Uh, or it could be a crevasse if you're skiing on the glacier, then you should probably stay away from that slope. Right, thank you. Another question just about uh, terrain tra traps. Yeah. It says, uh, uh, what's that one? Hold on. Oh, how, how do you spot? How do you spot a risky cornice? Well, I would say oh, no. all cornices are risky. Um, and uh, if you have even the slightest notion that it might be a cornice on the ridge you're going up to, stay well, well away. Uh, I was actually shocked when I started reading all these accident reports, how many of them were actually uh, cornices that dropped. And um, my worst, um, closest cold ever uh, in terms of uh, avalanches uh, was a cornice as well. And uh, I would, any ridge or summit you go up on, if you are unsure, just think there might be a cornice there. Just stay way, way, way away from it. Because it's, even if you, you could be, 50 meters from the edge of the cornice, and that could be the attachment point. And you'd be surprised how little extra weight you would have to put on it and the whole enormous thing can drop off. So just if you are coming up to a ridge or a peak and you haven't been able to see the other side of it um, before you went up, just stay well, well away from the, from the edge of it. Good advice, thank you. The uh, one of yeah one of the questions I was going to ask ask you actually was um, not given their name but um, they said have you got any tips for assessing I know you talk about not wanting to get bogged down with the assessing snowpack but is there any way to quickly assess snowpack and also maybe the gradient of a slope if you're a little bit unsure is there an easy easy way and slope instability as a result. I, in my opinion, uh, no for a question A about assessing the snowpack. It's uh, incredibly difficult um, to be able to tell from looking at the snowpack if there's going to be an avalanche or not. But you can, obviously, there's indications in the terrain and the snow that you can see. Um, and that's obviously if you see there's natural avalanches all around you, uh, I would assume that there is instability in the snowpack. And um, also, I mean, like, uh, wind would always is one of the factors that can create 
avalanche danger because it packs the snow. So if you can see signs in the snow that there has been wind and the, the, the snow is sticking together, it's obviously more dangerous than if the snow is completely light and fluffy. And uh, if you're out ski touring and you hear sounds in the snow, if the whole snowpack goes whoop when you're walking, that is an indication that there is a weak layer in the snowpack. And basically to have an avalanche in the first place, you need two things. You need a weak layer in the snowpack and you need the snow to um, be somewhat uh, connected in the upper layer to create a flake. Um, but for a normal person to be able to dig into the snow and have a look at the, the layers of the snow and predict if it's going to be uh, avalanche danger or not, I think is uh, extremely difficult. So uh, even for experts, that could be um, a bit of a guessing game. So um, I think uh, the best approach would be normally to use a guide, I would say, if you're not very experienced. Thank you. There's quite a few questions coming through about interference from one device to another. So uh, I know you've I know you've covered this, but um, basically you were saying keep things about thirty centimeters apart, and there shouldn't be any um, you know interference between your transceiver and your phone. People ask you about GPS watches having any interference, things like that. But uh, uh, well, I'm not entirely sure with GPS watches actually. I, uh, I don't really use for myself, but uh, I, I, I can't say that I've read anything in recent uh, studies uh, or avalanche reports about it. But, uh, but probably um, when it comes to that, maybe do a, a quick uh, Google search. Yeah, uh, but pretty much uh, radios, radios work on a different frequency to transceivers, so there shouldn't be any issue there. Yeah. Is, that, is that true? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, and, and yeah. Like, okay. I'm just going by what I've learned from uh, from uh, different manufacturers. Great. But actually, I forgot there to answer your uh, the second part of your question before about um, ways of of, uh, of uh, seeing the steepness of, of the slope you're going to ski. So obviously, the really important thing here is 30 degrees. Basically, if it's less than 30 degrees. Uh, there can't physically be an avalanche. And if it's more than, as it's steeper than 30 degrees, you're getting into avalanche terrain. So having um, a device to measure the steepness of the slope you're on can be very, very important. And uh, there's a bunch of apps you can get that you can work on your phone. And uh, you can also get, <clears throat> I think Peeps makes, you guys probably sell it, but it's a little, uh, device that you can strap to your pole and you can put the pole down in the snow and see the steepness. Um, yep. so being able uh, to tell the steepness of the slope you're on is very important in avalanche terrain and and um, it could be a good good way of training too when you're um, even if you're not in avalanche terrain but to try and guess the steepness of the terrain you're in and, and use the app on your phone and see how close you are to kind of calibrate your uh, your brain to to uh, know when it's steeper than 30 degrees and then uh, use that when you're out skiing so your internal alarm kind of goes on when you're like okay I feel like this terrain here is steeper than 30 degrees okay well we're gonna change our approach now we got to be careful great thank you for that um, sorry just reading this one just to check we haven't Covered it. They're all they're all of a similar kind of vein, but different angles. It's quite interesting. So, Brendan Brendan asks. I totally agree about the point about avalanche courses overly focused on snowpack uh, and not enough on the key decision making. But with relatively novice backcountry riders, what are the steps in making the go no go go decisions? Is there a quick answer to that one, or <laughs> kind of quite depth? Well, I think I kind of, I guess I got into it before, like I can only talk from my own experience, but I think, as I said before, when I stand on top of the slope for me, well, first of all, obviously, is the slope um, uh, steeper than 30 degrees. If it's 
not steeper than 30 degrees to camp in avalanche. So then obviously it's a go. And, but then uh, the next step is, okay, it's steeper than 30 degrees. Okay. Is there an avalanche trap? No, there's no avalanche trap. Okay. Am I by myself? Uh, if the answer is yes, well, it's a no-go because there's no one there to rescue you. Uh, do I have uh, friends with me? Uh, yes. Okay, that changes it. That that makes it possible. Are these friends uh, have experience in in uh, avalanche rescue? Uh, if the answer is no, it's still a no go. If the answer is yes, then you could probably ski the slope. So I think it's like if you go through and kind of eliminate it like that, and um, and then you have a green light at the end, then I think it's it's a go. But uh, all those things have to be in place. And in my opinion, the absolutely most important is that there is no avalanche trap and then the, the other ladies come on top of that. Great, thank you. Adrian asks, what's the best way to get avalanche or well, information about the snowpack and avalanche boards? And I guess that depends on A, where you are. I guess in yeah. France where you are, you have a specific Daily yeah. bulletin, whereas in Scotland they have something as well. So, yeah, every every country I think uh, where you're likely to ski uh, in Scandinavia, the Alps, and North America, you will have um, a daily avalanche report, and um, that's obviously a place uh, very important. I think <clears throat> for me, I think the the avalanche um, scale in a way, like you have like. Avalanche danger one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, it doesn't tell you all that much uh, in many ways because basically avalanche danger one is a uh, spring day where there's very little chance of an avalanche. Avalanche danger two is, you know, probably usually has been a couple of weeks after snowfall. There's still a risk, but not as likely. And after three is where kind of everything happens. That's your powder day. That, that's when you really want to be skiing, but it's also the most dangerous um, because avalanche danger four, all the ski resources would be closed. So I think when you look uh, at the avalanche report, it's important to not only look at the number, but also to look at what the text actually says, because there will be information there that says that uh, this is an isolated problem uh, from 2,000 meters and up on north facing slopes or so there'd be more information in there. So I think the number itself kind of gives you an indication where it is, but then you need to look into what the actual avalanche problem is. Um, so if you can, you know, like read into the text too and then and uh, see if you can find some more accurate information there that could that can help you make a decision of uh, where you want to ski on that particular day. Thank you. There's a couple of questions coming in around sort of going from being a beginner to going on a backcountry sort of trip and what sort of timeline, it's a tricky one, Matt, but what sort of timeline and kind of training would you say that someone has to go on to make sure that they're, I guess, backcountry aware or avalanche aware, I should say. <clears throat> it's really hard to say. I, I mean, like, I would say if you um, need to ask, ask the question, then you're probably not ready. And uh, I think the best approach is uh, always to use a guide. And um, I think particularly maybe for, for British people that always travel to go skiing, there's very little chance that you will have time to, to spend over a long period of time in the same place to learn about what, what's happening in the snowpack through the season. And, and um, even for myself, like I, I know what's going on here in Chamonix because I'm here every day, but if I travel to, to Norway or to Canada or whatever, I will always make sure that I talk to local guides or use the local guide um, because they have the, the local knowledge and that is crucial. 
but uh, I would always strongly recommend using a guide, not only for safety, but the guide's second job after keeping you safe is to find the best snow. And yep. uh, you, you can come to a resort like Chamonix and think that everything is tracked and you go around by yourself, you never find any good snow. If you have a good guide in that same week, you could be skiing perfect snow every day. So it's a good investment. You spend a lot of money on the equipment and you travel, but I would recommend spending that extra little money on someone to help you with the safety decisions. And it's also a great way of learning for, for uh, later trips and uh, to find the, the best snow, you know? Yeah, obviously some of the best days I've had on skis have been with a guide. It's been brilliant, so well worth it. Um, are we okay? We've got a couple, couple more questions. Is that right? Uh, you yeah, okay for that? Yeah. I know you're an hour ahead of us over there. So um, it's just we've awesome. got so many questions. We'll you just take care. a couple more. I'm just, lost in anyway. Um, so one of the someone who doesn't leave their name, but it's really useful, says that the the device for measuring slope angles is called Slope Slope Angel, um, and you can find them at SlopeAngel.com. Uh, so that's useful. And um, there was a question here. Where's your favorite place to, to ski? Presumably Chamonix, because that's where you live, but it might be somewhere uh, else. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many good places. And on the normal season, I do a lot of traveling. So, uh, um, and obviously now it's a little bit different. So normally on the normal season, I'll be traveling a lot. And I'm always saying that... Uh, that I always miss coming back to Chamonix, but like this year, when I can't travel, I, I kind of feel like I would have loved to go traveling and uh, to some different spots. But uh, my favorite place to ski depends a little bit on the season. I One of my favorite trips is to go to uh, BC this time of year and go on a hot trip somewhere in the interior BC. Um, I absolutely love that. and. Um, I think February, um, either Japan or uh, uh, late, let me, or late January, early February, Japan, or maybe here in the Alps. And uh, in the spring, I really love going to Norway. Uh, it's really special up there in the spring with the um, midnight sun. Uh, I mean, you can go skiing any time of day and uh, you can ski into June sometimes. So it really depends on the, um, on the time of the season but uh yeah there's so many good places best, best place to ski in Norway. i've never skied in norway it's on my uh it's on my uh, list yeah no i mean there there is so many good places in norway the north is uh so the lingen alps and the low Foten is very special um and then but that's kind of almost becoming so popular that it's too many people up there that there's a lot of um a lot of uh, European or Central Europeans, like Germans and Italians and stuff, going up there in the spring. But uh, there's a bit of a secret spot uh, in a way. It's a mountain range in the middle of Norway called Jotunheimen, uh, which is actually the highest peaks in Norway, um, and uh, it has fantastic skiing. It's not the, the, as big of elevation gain as you get on the coastal mountains in Norway. Uh, but everything's above the tree, tree level, so it's like really like nice smaller alpine peaks with great snow and there's really nice lodges all around there. And you can do trips from lodge to lodge or stay in one lodge and you're like right in the mountains, you're sitting at the breakfast table seeing the lines you're going to ski through the day and you come back and you sit at the dinner table and see your tracks that you made uh, through the day and then um, yeah, it's a uh, Check that out. It's called Jotunheimen. It's the mountain range. Good, uh, good tip for uh, April, April trip, April May, maybe. It's. Uh, I'm already going to plan it. That's what we're going to do. Uh, <clears throat> that's really good. Thank you very much, Stan. And uh, just loads of questions there. Thank you everyone for for, for participating and sending in your questions. Someone's uh, email, uh, just sort of messaged in saying the Eagle Ski Club apparently run tours and um and things like that so maybe check them out as well so 
Um, yeah. But basically, if anyone wanted to, because you're you're a mountain guide over in Chamonix, or are you, yeah, you work I, across Europe? I, I am a mountain guide, but I don't really work much as a guide at the moment. Uh, so I'm basically my job situation is uh, as a professional sponsored athlete and uh, i do a lot of uh, product development both for our carex and uh, vocal marco del bello uh, so at the moment i'm not really taking guide jobs um, and uh, which i guess is a pretty good thing these days as there's a lot of lot of mountain guides in the alps these days with uh, not a whole lot of work because of the corona situation so Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah and just just to touch on uh, just to touch on what you do for Art Terrets and and Vocal is is you said product development so that they send you some gear you report back on it and uh, well you, you, it, could, it could be both ways so it could be uh, I would have an idea and then pitch it to one of the companies to uh, see if they have any interest in developing it so. Lately, I've been working a lot on the uh, new backpacks for uh, Arcteryx ski packs. Uh, and also, I have this, I don't know if you guys saw this, but this is a new uh, Del Bello quantum boot that I've developed, which is a one kilo ski touring boot. And uh, that actually has some pretty good ski ability, which is been a problem with a really light touring gear before now it's like it hasn't skied very well and uh we see like what's happening here in the alps right now because obviously the lifts are closed so everything is ski touring and chamonix you have to walk up 800 meters to get to to the tree line so the weight of your gear is just all of a sudden becoming very important and the people that used to use kind of more free ride style gear is now changing to much lighter equipment because of the, you know, like now, if you want to have a good day, you got to tour at least 2000 vertical meters really to get some good skiing in. And uh, when you get up in into that kind of range, if you have uh, two and a half kilo on each leg or one kilo it makes a big difference. It's keeping you fit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and thank thank you so much for this evening. It's been really, really, uh, really good. And as someone said, it's always worth talking about how we stay alive. Thanks for that, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, big big thanks to Art Terex for helping uh, organise this evening. And um, hopefully we'll have some more talks over the next few weeks and months. So do check out the website and uh, sign up for a few more talks. And um, yeah, have a, have a great evening. Thanks and enjoy your, you're out tomorrow, I think. Are you skiing? Are you saying the weather's coming in? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We're, we're waiting for a big storm to roll in. And uh, so I'm not really sure how much snow is gonna come overnight, but definitely through the day tomorrow, we should have, they're saying well, maybe up to 50, 60 centimeters here in town. So um, there should be a lot of snow coming. So it should be interesting, but yeah. Um, we are going to have a major avalanche problem as well. So uh, it's uh, kind of time to not get too excited and uh, play it safe for a while. Yeah, so, I think I think in the UK, we just have to keep keep looking at all the pictures and uh, fingers crossed yeah. we'll get some, get some yeah. snow. <laughs> I really hope you guys uh, get to get to travel out and come skiing this year. I bet it's Thank tough you. there and seeing it snowing here, so. Fingers crossed that uh, this situation will solve itself and uh, you guys get some snow this year. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, stay, yeah. stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.